In the fight against climate change, we are being asked to dig for victory, plant a tree to fight the effects of fossil fuels. How effective could that be? Welcome to Roundtable. Hello from me, David Foster. Things are happening all around the world, but here in the UK specifically, campaigners want a million people to join a mass tree planting event. Ethiopia's government says 350 million trees were planted in a single day this year. Planting a tree is now seen as one of the key solutions to the climate crisis, but not by everybody. According to new research, mass tree planting could be one of the best and cheapest ways to tackle climate change. One report suggests two-thirds of all emissions could be removed. But it would take a huge effort. 1.2 trillion trees, the report says, and time, 50 to 100 years to see those kinds of benefits. There are currently 1.7 billion hectares of treeless land that could be used to plant trees. World leaders have already committed to restoring 350 million hectares of forest by 2030. But some scientists argue that mass tree planting could do more harm than good. In the wrong place, it could mean more carbon is released, like in savannas and grasslands, which act as important carbon stores themselves. And planting lots of the same trees could lead to a loss of biodiversity. So is tree planting really one of the best answers to the climate crisis? OK, let us start talking green with me at the round table. We have Carol Honeybun Kelly from the Woodland Trust. We have Dr Minerva Singh, who's a research fellow at Imperial College London. And in Zurich, we can join Professor Tom Crowther, a lecturer in ecosystem ecology, who says tree planting has massive potential. Edinburgh and Caroline Lehman, lecturer in biogeography at the University of Edinburgh. Jolly nice to have you all, all with us. Tom, can I come to you first of all? Um, your institution conducted a, a scientific study in which you found that tree planting was, as you put it, forest restoration isn't just one of our climate change solutions, it is overwhelmingly the top one. Explain if you would. Yeah, so I think when we talk, when we think about climate change solutions, We've got thousands of carbon drawdown solutions and also thousands of emissions reduction solutions. And we quantify them often in terms of the amount of carbon that they would save or capture. And so in terms of simply the amount of carbon, global forest restoration is a massive carbon drawdown solution. But it certainly doesn't mean it comes at the expense of all the other thousands of solutions that are definitely needed in combination. OK, so, so it, it captures the carbon dioxide that is pumped out by, uh, let's say, fossil fuels for one thing, but there are other things as, as well. Um, are there enough trees at the moment to do that? So there's a huge number of trees, about three trillion trees across the world at the moment, and they are doing a great job in drawing down lots of that carbon. But we have also depleted that number by almost a half since the start of sort of human civilization or at least uh, expansive agriculture. And so we really need to start recovering those forests if we're going to be able to capture some of that excess carbon that's in the atmosphere now. OK, look, look Carol, you, you, you love trees, obviously. I love trust. trees, yes, absolutely. More and more people are buying trees and planting trees. Yeah. But I had always believed, I've been taught, and everybody can join in on this, I've been taught from an early age that, um, let's say, the Amazon basin was the lungs of the world, it took in the carbon dioxide, it gave us the oxygen that we need to have to, to live and to, and to breathe. Then I read in researching for this programme that most of the oxygen that's produced in the Amazon basin stays there. It just can't get out. So, actually, it's not going to make a lot of difference. Because if the oxygen stays in, then the carbon dioxide is not going to be absorbed. Uh, that's certainly sort of one interpretation I know it's simplistic. there. And, and just a little um, simplistic. But certainly what... <laughs> What you look at with tree planting is a number of other solutions as well. They are... We are thrilled at the Woodland Trust. We've always been an advocate for trees, native broadleaves in particular, and the recognition now of the role they have to play in tackling global, uh, global emissions and the climate crisis is significant. They won't 
halt it on their own. But whilst we are planting trees and to get to carbon net zero, that's what we're going to have to do. They will also be tackling for us in the UK the nature crisis of, of habitat and biodiversity. So trees here can be a huge solution. And across the globe, we've seen also um, that people are wanting as well to initiate creation and restoration and salvage projects to keep trees um, on the forefront of the agenda. And we require our government and many governments around the world mm. to continue with the promises that they've made on that issue. Let, let us go around the table. And so, Minerva, to you just right now, and, and then on to you, Caroline, and to talk about what good you think planting more trees will do? Because I know you, there's scepticism about whether it will actually uh, be the number one saviour, as Tom has suggested, uh, that it, it won't do any harm. It might not necessarily save the planet. No. Well, uh, now, Tom, he, he produced one study, and Bastien, Jean-Francois Bastien, he also produced a global-scale study, which tells us that, again, planting trees and having massive afforestation programmes... Effectively could, could change the planet. If we put in one trillion trees, and I know there's a UN program to put in yes. one trillion, what do you think about the suggestion from Tom and from others that it is the number one thing? Well, it is the number one thing. I, I'm on board with that, but you still have to cut down your emissions. I mean, there's no getting past the, uh, the fact that we still have to cut, uh, cut down the emissions, and that's not something that we can lose sight of. So if you want our one trillion trees to effective uh, in delivering okay, so, the goals. So I think everybody want. says we need more trees. But, we Caroline, my question trees. to you yeah. is, is, is this to help restore biodiversity, on the one hand, or to stop climate change? I, in my view, I think the world is made up of a glorious diversity of ecosystems. And the world is not just a forest and it's not just made up of trees. And... We need to fundamentally respect the Earth's biodiversity and its biodiverse set of ecosystems. And the reality is that adding trees in a number of those ecosystems actually leads to degradation of that biodiversity. And there are so many examples of that. 20% of the Earth's land surface is made up of tropical savannas and grasslands where we have repeated evidence where increasing tree cover in those systems leads to declines in biodiversity. It also changes uh, surface water flows and alters how people can utilise those ecosystems. And many of the people living in those parts of the world are the world's poorest people who depend on those ecosystems and the services that they provide in the current form, where increased tree cover could, for instance, reduce livestock forage. OK, so let's throw this one out to each and every one of you. Uh, Tom, I'll, I'll start with you, but any time you want to come in. More trees, yes, but the right trees in the right places, otherwise it could go horribly wrong. Yes. That's exactly right. To be honest, what everyone's saying is entirely right. The, the value of forest restoration is only reached if we restore the right types of trees with high levels of diversity. It cannot be monocultures in areas where trees would naturally exist. Uh, and we mentioned earlier the 0 0.9 billion hectares of land that's available for forests. Those are areas where forests would naturally exist under today's climate. So they're actively not those, you know, there's huge, most of the land surface is not suitable for trees. There's diverse grasslands and savannas and shrublands and also incredibly important peatlands and wetlands that store huge amounts of carbon. But the areas that could be forested have the potential to draw down loads of, loads of carbon. And I just want to come back to your point about being the number one solution. When you say number one, you could interpret that in many different ways. You could say, oh, maybe it's the most of the carbon drawdown or maybe the biggest impact on, on the temperature. Both of those are hard to say. But I think what we, what we mean when we say the number one solution is it's the number one for you and I to get involved, for every person to be involved. Because most of the other climate change solutions require huge technological advances or scientific discoveries that can incentivize and promote effective emissions cuts. The nice thing about this is it's a simple one for every one of us to get engaged with by either donating to restoration projects or getting out and planting trees yourself. And it has these really valuable impacts on biodiversity when done right. OK, but we are the um, overexcited, undereducated public who don't know where to put which trees. We've got to be told and we need the experts to help us. So since you're yeah. here representing the Woodland Trust yes. in the United Kingdom, mm. 
It sounds, go out and tell your council you want to plant a tree, tell schools you want to plant a tree, find a bit of land where you want to plant a tree. It sounds a bit chaotic. Um, it could be, but we would encourage it not to be, and I absolutely agree with Tom. It's something that everyone can get involved in, and that's what makes those connections. But that's the danger as well, isn't it? It is, and why? What, at the moment, we currently run programmes that, that share about a million trees a year with schools and community groups across the UK, and most of those aren't experienced planters, so they get advice from us on what they should be looking at, um, how to speak to landowners uh, or parish councils or anybody like that whose land they might want to try or on local playing fields that might need a new head. So it's all about figuring out where you might want to plant, getting permission to do so, and, and telling us what you're going to do so we can have a look at your plan and, and make sure that it's going to work. And if you haven't quite got the right trees there, we will guide you on what to do and give you some follow-up information as well after that. And the reason uh, as well why everyone can get involved is because of the versatility of tree planting. So we talk about forests because that's the way to get huge numbers out there. But the picture behind us, the single um, field tree there that will do so much for livestock and people. One of my favourite photographs is a picture of a tree with loads of people underneath it in a sunny day of the south of France because that's where everybody wanted to be, just in the shade. So you can plant a couple of trees in the middle of a field, unproductive field margins, wet field corners, you know, along rivers uh, to do a thousand jobs for us. So we shouldn't get too hung up about the forestry and woodland. There are so many other ways that we can integrate trees into the landscape and keep that mosaic culture that, that you'll see here and, in fact, all over the globe. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. And uh, such trees, at least in the tropical context, these are the keystone trees. So we talk about growing trees or groups of trees in agricultural landscapes in Asia, and that allows mobile taxa to transverse a hostile agricultural matrix. So, you know, Laos, where I did my field work, you had these huge fields and surrounded by forests. This is what I don't understand. You're saying fantastic school children, councils, farmers, landowners. Uh, you're talking about what's happening in different parts of, parts of the world. But I have read two studies, and I am not an expert, so tell, tell me if uh, I'm wrong or these studies are wrong. Both of which say, one from 2006, uh, from Ken Caldera at the Carnegie Institution, of Washington, that's Stanford, California, then the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, very recently, that say, unless you plant it, these are trees, in a very narrow band around the equator, up to 20 degrees in latitude and then down to 20 degrees in latitude, it is, as Caldera says it, to plant forests to mitigate climate change outside of the tropics is a waste of time, and in fact, it can have the opposite effect, because put trees there, they can absorb sunlight, they keep the warmth, and you don't cool the planet, you actually heat it up. Uh, he says this is basically uh, polluting with a clear conscience. So... And there's another tiny... Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, Minerva, please, first. Sorry, and there's another tiny problem. Some, uh, at least uh, in the context of Mediterranean ecosystems, that some tree species are more flammable than others. So if you insist on planting pines in an ecosystem, you may end up with increased fuel load and increased risk of fires. So, again, it's... So, not only are you actually warming the planet, you're making it more combustible You could make an ecosystem well. more So, he has a point when he says, uh, this allows you to pollute with a clear conscience. I don't know why we're talking about this if it's so dodgy. Caroline. So, thanks very much. So, just in terms of these projects, I love the idea of an individual action. What often concerns me is that places like countries in Africa are targets for afforestation programs, and so people can be donating to plant trees in a country, to a place, to a, a culture and a location that they've never experienced. And how do we monitor, how do we know that this tree planting is being done in the ecologically sensitive way, in the socially sensitive way that we know is absolutely necessary for it to be positive as a carbon benefit, but also for it to be socially positive and for it to have longevity. You know, Minerva's point there about changing the flammability of ecosystems is really important because we know that forestry plantations all across the tropics where we plant up eucalyptus, where we plant up pines, they do become fire risks. And in planting in semi-arid regions as well, we do have then a drought risk. So you can yes. go for, you can yeah. establish a large planting program but how do you safeguard that against the kind of the ecological issues, but then also 
the the changes and extreme events in terms of weather and fire risk mm. as well. So you I think there to be absolutely. A of conversations. But the thing yeah. is, Tom, I'm, I'm getting slightly put off here. Instead of planting a tree, I might go and get an electric car. <laughs> well, get an electric car as well. Do yes, it all. Yes, why no electric? Way. Yeah, but it why do I need a tree if it's going to cause all these problems? You have to do it all. Climate change is way too big to be squabbling over solutions. We need everyone. That's the baseline. But all these... But, but I, I'm reading out a report which says, done anywhere other than in the tropics, it can do more harm than good. And, and, and yet these plants... You're still talking about the forest word, aren't you, as well? You're forgetting the tree word that comes in that. So it's all about the suitability of what you do with those plants in the right place. And you said it yourself in the introduction, the yeah. right place at the right time, and you won't find anyone here that disagrees with that. But, no, but he's, say, he's saying having forest planting trees in these places, uh, you know, they actually sort of just soak up the and, heat. China are putting in three billion. That's out of this area. India's going to put in five billion. And I think Caroline's right. Wrong place. And, and Tom, Tom's going to come right in there. There you go. Look at that. And Sorry. even... I, I, Sorry, I, I, let's get Tom first. And as uh, Caroline yeah. mentioned, she, uh, she spoke about the eucalyptus trees and planting eucalyptus trees, it has been associated with an increased drought risk and lowering of the water table in parts of India and Bangladesh. So even in the tropics and subtropics, you need to be very careful about what tree you're planting where. You see, the thing is, Carol and, and, and Tom... Sorry, we... Tom, Tom's desperate. <laughs> OK, Tom, I know you're desperate. I'll, I'll go on, off you go. Let me just give my answer to the albedo thing. You're right. In many parts of the very high latitudes, you plant dark-coloured trees and you warm the planet because those dark trees absorb a lot more of the sun's energy than snow would otherwise. Snow reflects but, the heat, but... yeah. It, no, it absorbs a lot. The trees absorb the heat, the snow would, would reflect That's what it. I say, yeah. The snow, the snow kicks it back, the trees keep it. So those analyses are very complicated because you've got to take into account the albedo, the carbon storage, and the evapotranspiration. Those trees are also producing clouds, which immediately have a cooling impact. And there are still no studies that have absolutely got a handle on the full impact of the warming or the cooling impact of every location around the globe. But I would say it is true that at the very highest latitudes, you're likely to have a warming impact. That means still, from the tropics all the way up to the temperate, you're likely to have a cooling impact. And the other thing that are not considered in any of the studies yet is the enormous amount of carbon storage that happens below ground. And that truly isn't represented in any of those studies. The carbon storage that happens below ground, when you restore <laughs> ecosystems correctly, the right species in the right regions, is absolutely huge. Everybody so wants to talk. On that, <laughs> Caroline, please. <laughs> yes. And on the soil carbon point, I completely agree. Soil uh, carbon is just so fundamental and it's also worth remembering that some of these ancient grassland ecosystems that are now targets for afforestation, grasslands in North America are often store more soil carbon than tropical forests do in a grub above ground biomass. And so, as Tom says, it is a very complex picture, but we also know that tree planting in semi-arid regions in the tropics, it can produce a net warming for decades before there's actually a positive effect in terms of carbon sequestration. So there's a really nuanced conversation to have about tree planting that involves ecology, that involves the long-term processes intermixed with the fact that climate change is accelerating and a whole bunch of places that weren't at risk of drought and fire in the past are at risk now. And are you so, going to be able to convince... Seven-year-old, Carol, when you go into their classroom, when you say, look, here's a, here's a seedling, we'd like you to go out and plant it because he's actually going to do an awful lot of good. Are you going to go into all of these arguments about the downside as well and the type of tree and, and the communities and the wetlands and the snow? You, you, you actually, can't tell everybody. We can't here, in, um, and the Woodland Trust is very much focused within the UK. We don't have an export licence. Nobody wants our oak trees. It wouldn't help anybody um, right tree in the right place. So we can certainly talk about the sensitivity yeah. of landscapes and the things to think about with in the UK and that's very very important to us and because the problem is difficult doesn't mean that you shouldn't try and solve it and make it into manageable chunks so if you speak to a, 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 a school age say a nine-year-old and say well actually yep this is going to take by the time it sort of um, reaches 25 you will have children of your own it's a very good way to show that actually action is required now um, the best time to plant a tree was about 25 years ago, uh, as I understand it. The very good news is that the next best time is now. So it's about introducing them to the, 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 the fact that this isn't instantly solvable, but it's everyone's responsibility now to take some action and do it now 
in order that as they grow and, and develop, they can explore other solutions and they will have made a start right back there at primary school. I, I quoted Caldera, Professor Caldera. He wasn't the only one who did the study, but um, he did come up with this thing. Um, you're polluting with a clear conscience. We're not polluting. When you've bought your electric car and then you can open the back seat to all the diversity that can't live in the tree you could have planted when you chose to <laughs> buy your electric no car. That, absolutely, you could do that and, 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 and things sort of burrowing in. So don't forget that a tree, as well as reacting to the climate crisis that we're talking about here by locking up uh, a carbon below soil and, and the other sort of effects that it has, it will be a home for many forms, thousands of forms of wildlife, if you're talking about oak and beech. It will be never off duty. When your car's in the garage, the tree will still be there in the dark hours. And if it's there to stop soil erosion, if it's there to reduce juice surface water runoff, if it's giving wildlife a home, if it's providing shade or shelter for uh, animals, livestock, or humans, or buildings, mm. it will do that all the time while it's doing everything else. It yeah. is nature's original multi -caster. I once read a book about how to write a good screenplay and it said you start off really, really well and then you go along and then you go dip right down and we did this in this programme because we started thinking trees were number one and then we found out all the problems with them. Now we're coming back out the other side to the happy ending, are we? Now, Could I, I have a little issue about woodlands. Many years ago, I did some field work in Wytham Woods and we all turned up. I turned up armed with an apple and Wytham Woods in Oxfordshire, it's dominated by oak ash, beech, the usual stuff. And they said, don't throw your apple core here because now you will introduce an exotic or a non-native species in Wytham Woods. And I was like, what's wrong with my little apple? I mean, everyone will get an apple after 10 years. So what's the problem with my approach of sticking in an apple Should we leave that question up in the air? And if we've got time, I'll get yeah, you to exactly. answer it. But Caroline, everybody's so desperate to say something. It's your <laughs> turn. <laughs> It's about an ecosystem, it's not about a tree. And we have to remember that the habitats that we're so desperate to create are created through a mosaic in an environment. And that could be at a landscape scale, not just a woodland, but a mosaic of ecosystems that promote diversity in a catchment, in a country and in a region. So I think when we're talking about just planting a tree to create a habitat and a home, that is kind of glossing over the fact that it's actually the glorious complexity of ecosystems that create the diversity on Earth today. And also, uh -huh. I, I made a note earlier saying it's, it's about the relationship between people and forest, big group called Tree Sisters that goes out and helps to plant in parts of Africa, I think India also. Um, and the people there come to understand once again how valuable the trees can be for their, for their livelihood. Sorry, I mean, Tom. Tom. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to come back to your point about it being really complicated and how you're going to explain that to a school child. The nice thing is science can help us. So we now have maps showing you where trees should be and where trees shouldn't be. We have those maps showing that if you restore native grasslands, you can store huge amounts of carbon in the soil. If you restore wetlands, you can store huge amounts of carbon in the soil. But you can also see which regions should be restored into, into forests at, or into individual trees in a field. And you can even also see which types of trees should be there, what level of diversity should be there. And you can even now click on a map to see 6,000 dots around the world in all the places... Is, is this the UN map that I was looking at earlier? No, that is not the no, UN because map. Because that, that showed so me an we... awful lot of tree planting in, in Siberia, which I wasn't so sure was definitely going to be the best thing. I, uh, I, where, I, where do we yeah. find this map of yours? Well, you can see it on our Trillion Trees website. So we've got 6,000 projects around the world, all in the tropics at the moment, but we have got other wetland restoration projects that are starting up in the high latitudes. And you can just click, you can first see what types of tree they're planting, what types of ecosystem they're, re they're restoring in, and you can immediately donate to give money to those projects that are already up and running and established. And they've all been scientifically validated by the scientists and they're working with the best scientific information. So it really can be simplified with all of this information okay. when you're working with the experts in the right areas. You, you all love trees, so that, that, that's pretty clear. Carol, I'll, I'll give you a chance if I can. But do you yeah. remember back to when you were very young and, and you first saw a tree, did you ever imagine that it might play such a part in perhaps saving our planet? Did you ever think it was possibly one of the most wonderful things there was? I think trees have always been, uh, if you're born here, integral to people's lives, and it goes back through our history, what we use trees for, and, and you will know, anybody who drives to work will no doubt have those markers in their landscape that, you know, they've driven past for years, whether on leisure or on their way to work, and they are part of our landscape. As we start to lose some of them, as we are with ash, 
they will be noticeable by their absence and maybe not till then. When I was a child, no, I, I didn't have that thing, but I had a sense of, of grounding and that they were there and I expected them to always be there. And I would like that diversity and the beautiful mosaic of different habitats that we've got in this country maintained and where we can, augmenting those with trees to ensure that we, we respond rightly to the climate challenge with the resources that we've got available, whilst we figure out some other solutions as well. Love a tree, love the world. Is that the answer, Tom? Mm. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> and, of course, you can always right tie a rope to a tree. You can always get swing off it when you're a kid or get your kids to do the same thing. Uh, some people carve love hearts on trees, don't they? They are used useful to climb for them. so many different things. I used to climb them. It was a great workout. Oh, it was fantastic. Listen, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, appreciate you coming on. Tom, Caroline, thank you very much indeed, uh, Minerva. David, can yes, I just yes, say, quickly. if anybody does else love quick. trees, big climate fight back, hashtag every tree counts, look out for the Woodland Trust. You said it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for watching. Thank you to my guests for taking part. Uh, goodbye for now from me, David Foster, and the Roundtable team. See you soon.